Hello, welcome to, today, to today's panel conversation, Improving the Coverage of Science and Race in a Time of Reckoning. I'm Nicholas St. Fleur, a science reporter with STAT who covers health disparities, and I'll be your moderator. This workshop has been developed by CASW and supported by funding from the Kavli Foundation. Our goal is to tackle the challenges of fully engaging diverse audiences and focusing our attention on racial justice and systemic racism as they crop up in science journalism. Kavli challenged CASW to find ways to address important ethics issues specific to science journalism. Roz Ride um, of CASW enlisted the help of Robin Morantz Hedig, former NASW president, to think through how to meet this mission in the context of today's racial reckoning, prompted by, among other things, the killing of George Floyd in May 2020, and the wide racial disparity in the effects of COVID in the months since then. Today's panel will be divided into two parts. The first will be a journalistic deep dive into a 2018 story, why, why America's Black mothers and babies are in life or death crisis, from the New York Times Magazine, written by Linda Villarosa. During the second part, a few notable scholars will take a longer view of social justice, institutional racism, and the roles of science journalists, which will be moderated by Evelyn Hemmins. Uh, chair of Harvard's Department of the History of Science. To begin the first portion, let me introduce my guests. We have Linda Villarosa. Linda is a contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine covering race and public health and a former executive editor at Essence Magazine. Her book, Under the Skin, Racism, Inequality, and the Health of a Nation will be published by Doubleday in June, 2022. I know I'm looking forward to that book. <laughs> Jessica Lustig. Jessica is a deputy editor specializing in politics and investigations for the New York Times Magazine. And finally, Arlene uh, Geronimus, the founding director of the Public Health Demography Training Program at the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research. She originated an analytic framework, Weathering, that posits that the health of African Americans is subject to early health deterioration as a consequence of social exclusion. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to our discussion here. And I'm really hoping that we can make this like uh, uh, a conversation between the four of us. So to begin, Linda, I mean, your story, it was, it really, it gripped my heart. Um, just reading reading the, the, the story of Simona Landrum. And I, I guess to start off, I'd love to hear more about how did you come across this story idea and how did you go across pitching it to the Times Magazine? Um, well, first, thank you. Hi, Nick. Um, good to see you. Um, I am trying not to cry because <laughs> I never get, a, you know, my two of my favorite people in the same screen <laughs> like this, Arlene and Jessica, and I admire you both so much and I'm really grateful. Um, well, I had, uh, I met Jessica at a party that she threw for women journalists um, a couple years before. And so I was teaching at City College. I had used to work for the Times newspaper, but wasn't working there anymore. So I met Jessica at this party and we started talking and she said, if you ever have anything to pitch, let me know. So at first I was like, she doesn't really mean it. So then I pitched a story about HIV AIDS in the South and had the wonderful experience of working with her. And that ended up being a cover story. I became a contributing writer. And so then I was playing soccer on a Saturday afternoon. And one of the people on the soccer team worked for the Center for um, Reproductive Rights. And she said, did you know, she, she said this work I've been doing, I think you should hear about it because it's in your wheelhouse. So she's talking about maternal mortality. Um, and I thought she was talking about it in developing countries because it just sounded so strange. And I was like, really, I don't, I don't cover international. And she said, no, this is in the United States. And so I started grilling her. I was like, is it in only the deep South? Where is it? She said, no, the report we're working on is in New York City. And I said, is it just about poverty? Is it this terrible thing that's happening to really poor women because they don't have access? And so she said, a black woman, woman with an advanced degree is more likely to die or almost die in childbirth than a white woman with an eighth grade education. And then she turned to me and she said, don't you have a master's degree? And all of a sudden I went, oh, 
So it was an easy pitch to Jessica because at that time um, in 2017, most no one was really talking about this yet. So when I pitched it to her, it was quick. And, and um, the first round of it, though, was, oh, I'm going to do this really nice story about doulas and how they're so wonderful and they help solve this problem. So that was the first draft that <laughs> didn't really fly exactly <laughs> how I had thought. Right. And, and Jessica, tell me a bit about, you know, receiving that pitch. What, what were your first thoughts? What were your first questions? Um, so we had had this previous experience with Linda um, during which uh, we really saw, we meaning the editors at the magazine, really saw that Linda has, you know, the decades to about two decades, you know, of uh, more, right, of like real expertise. I mean, this is someone who has you know, deep reserves of uh, scientific, she has uh, scientific understanding. Um, she has uh, expertise in terms of research, in terms of um, uh, knowing who to interview, who are the, the people that are most important to hear from, um, including actually uh, Arlene uh, Geronimus here in the field, which I'm, I sort of, I'm a little geeked out that Arlene is here too, because she played a key part um, in the story. And, um, and uh, under, understanding data, understanding quality data, when you need more, um, what are the right stuff, what study are you know hyped but don't show what they supposedly show um what the correct takeaway is and also how to humanize um a story um that really draws readers in um and carries them along um when you're going to be presenting um sometimes some um you know some fairly sophisticated um scientific information um so you know, so we'd had again this this past experience with Linda, but but one more thing, um, Linda had gotten some feedback in the past that I think right that was like you know as so many writers do by the way um, that there should be you know an emphasis on um, you know whether it's like a note of hope or you know uh, well this this is you know the good thing and and we got really good messaging from the editor in chief of the Times Magazine, Jake Silverstein, who was like. This should be an indictment. You know, he read what Linda had served up, who had said it, and he was like, wait a second, we don't need to put a bow on this. We should go hard. We should like, and what is the most ambitious version, the hardest version, mm -hmm. where it like who's responsible? Mm -hmm. And we need to, you know, explain the science, like draw in with that humanistic right. reporting, but really go through. Mm -hmm. you know is there are there policy failures mm -hmm. um you know wh wh what should be done differently you know um how do we understand um how do we kind of put this squarely in the in the public interest make it clear it's a, a real public interest story so i just remember linda taking that and running with it she was like right. oh yeah oh we can <laughs> definitely do that you know and that is you know that's how you really put muscle behind a story like this. Um, and one of the things that we knew um, going in was that this story was going to have to be airtight, um, mm -hmm. bulletproofed, because a lot of people are invested in, um, you know, believing that there's maybe not a systemic reason um, mm -hmm. for outcomes, right? Maybe there, maybe it's about choice, um, you know, lifestyle. Um, and we're going to have to make clear, right, that statistics are, you know, the statistics are, are, are in the aggregate are showing something, you know, different from mm -hmm. lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we were going to have to do some, some um, really clear explanatory work to explain mm -hmm. the science that someone like, um, you know, Arlene Geronimus has, has really um, established. So I'll stop talking now, but, that, you know. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I, I love how you were speaking about, you know, really the, the, the humanity in Linda's story here. I mean, goodness, you, you, you feel like you're, you know, you're right there watching the birth or right there going through these struggles. So Linda, tell us a little bit more about how you found your sources in this piece. And then how did you bring in experts like, like Arlene into, into this story? I, I found um, 
the doula and her client, I went to decolonizing birth, which is a kind of like in our world, kind of underground uh, conference of uh, birth justice workers, doulas, midwives, people who do that work in Brooklyn. And so the same person that told me about the idea said, hey, do you know that woman, Latona Giwa? And I was like, who? And so she pointed to this wonderful, beautiful young woman. And she was wearing a little shirt that had a little birth pregnant person, but drawing on it. And she was with all these other young, wonderful people who had the same shirt on and they had these children with them. And I was like, who is that? They're so cute. Who are they? I want to know them. And so then she said, oh, Latona is a labor and delivery nurse who became jaded by the healthcare system and its problems. And now she's uh, started a social justice doula collective. So at first she was like, I don't want to talk to the media. So then somebody else said, hey, that's that woman from Essence <laughs> magazine. I was like, okay, good that she thinks I'm from Essence, not the ta scary times. Right. And so um, they introduced me to her I and the group. And then they invited me to come to uh, view their work. And then um, they, um, Latona said, oh, one of our clients wants to talk to you, um, Simone Landrum. She's had a really hard time. And so I ended up interviewing her on the, when I was leaving, on the last day of when I was leaving New Orleans. I honestly thought the story was done then. I had Simone's story. I had started gathering, doing this work, doing interviews. And then Simone gave me this look when I was leaving and I thought, she's trying to say, come back for my birth. That's what I intuited. And so then I thought, okay, I'll come back because I can put a nice happy ending on this story. Yay, there was baby born, he's fine now that she has the doula. So then I did come back and, um, and what I saw was the crux of the story because I was in the, the delivery room where she was going through labor and delivery and was treated so badly um, you know, in right in front of me. And it was, that became the sort of dramatic center of the piece in a way I had no idea. And then the other thing that happened was I was, I, I, the first time I interviewed Arlene, who I had never talked to her before. And so our first conversation was super fun. Okay. Cause I like to start out with how did you get into the work? So she went all the way back to her undergraduate years, and told me from start to finish her story. And I was loving how easily we connected, but then I think your husband was having eye surgery or something and you had to go. And so then when I talked to you the second time, I was in New Orleans. And so I said to Simone, oh, I have this really important interview with this researcher I really like. So she said, what kind of researcher? So I told her about your work. And she said the thing that really stuck with me. She goes, is she black? And I go, I know she's like a nice white woman uh, expert. And she said, white women, white people care about this. White people, and I remember that it stuck with me. And I thought, yeah, a lot of us care about this. And, um, and we care about avoiding the situation. This was before even, mm -hmm. this was when she was just still pregnant. Mm -hmm. And we, we care about this and it's a big issue. And she didn't understand that. And she didn't understand until later when you know I talked to her and she read the story that this was a big deal, that what she was going through was really um, important and she was making a big difference. Great. And Arlene, tell us a bit about, you know, speaking with Linda about your work, your research, and and you know, Linda comes up and says, you know, she's she's interested in hearing more about about weathering and such. What, what was that moment like? And and how did you feel your part kind of played out in this in this story? Um, it was wonderful talking to Linda, and I'm glad I took the call because I've been avoiding um, <laughs> um, journalists for a while because the same the same theory uh, and work was um, distorted, censored, uh, treated very poorly in the press um, when I was first developing it, and um, and I was feel you know. That is not a fun experience. I'll just put it that way, especially when you're as young as I was then, and um, and people, and because of how the press describes your work inaccurately, you end up with death threats or people threatening mm -hmm. saying you should be fired. So, I, I, Linda gets a lot of credit for um, for my opening up to her, and it, it's a testament to her, to her sincerity as a person and. Um, 
that she clearly care, cared about the issues, wasn't just doing a story. Uh, and uh, so we did have that wonderful first conversation. Um, um, it also helped that maybe because of her background in, in public health and health that she, she both, you know, caught on to things very quickly. I didn't have to explain things in the same detail I usually do. And she could, she having, she could identify with, with the kind of, um, from her days at Essence, I guess, with the things I was critiquing and the, the views of everything's your individual personal responsibility and it's your lifestyle and it's your, you know, that, that um, and those other kind of what are essentially racist tropes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so she, she sort of got the context as well as the science and, um, and, and that was, it was nice that we had that first conversation because it really did make me feel comfortable to talk to her again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as I said, I, I had kind of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, from talking to the press before. Um, I also, when the article came out, she did a spectacular job. Um, and I very much was impressed that she focused on this particular woman who was not Serena Williams, who was not, I mean, she mentions that, you know, um, who was not Beyonce. Um, I think that their stories get a lot of people's interest and, and make it harder to rely on, you know, you can't say that Serena Williams doesn't have a healthy lifestyle. You know, you can't say she had a kid as a teenager, she was a teenage mom, mm -hmm. or she wasn't married. So all the things that people have used as excuses to not really interrogate what's, or face what's really happened, um, um, there's a kind of shock value. I've used it myself sometimes in presenting, um, but but the women who really suffer <laughs> um, are women like Linda uh, profiled and mm -hmm. um, and maybe the stories of Serena and, and other high profile affluent um, uh, mothers um, who are doing all the quote playing by the rules things uh, got might have gotten people's attention to open up yeah. and not just dismiss um, Linda's story as another mm -hmm. one of those people who doesn't know how to right. take care of her health. So, right. so I think it all worked together. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I, I thought it was a really great choice. And it was a way to move the conversation mm -hmm. um, beyond just the kind of uh, the issues about celebrities. Um, and isn't this paradoxical or ironic right. or to realizing there's this fundamental issue and it's so mm -hmm. fundamental, it even affects older women, mothers mm -hmm. and wealthy mothers and right. um, very educated mothers. Mm -hmm. But on, on a daily basis, it's harming all black women and in particularly ones who don't have the resources mm -hmm. of Serena Williams to go and tell them you better take my, you know, right. do this, this test and see that I'm having blood clots because I know I am. Mm -hmm. You bring up a, a very fascinating point and I, I want to really pose this to, to, to Linda in terms of, I know you, you had said earlier when uh, you had been you know, working on this story, uh, someone had introduced you as, oh, she worked for Essence and I'd love to ask a bit about how your lived experiences helped you, you know, report this story or or what kind of impact do you think that brought to this this piece? And how were you able to not only build trust with your sources, but also show that, you know, you're someone deserving of trust, someone who can really do this story justice? Um, I think that, well, working at Essence was really helpful for, my, for um, you know, as, a, as, a, as my background, because it just made me so deeply empathetic to um, women, Black women, Black people, people's experiences. That was the wheelhouse at Essence was your job is to, um, you know, uplift the race. That's what it was. That's what we were supposed to be doing, providing information to help people live their lives better. That was the background. It was 
service journalism with a sort of social justice twist. And that was a really important um, beginning stomping ground for me there. And um, it, I also, because I was trained as a journalist, um, it was natural because many of the people, the editors at Essence did not have a journalism background. They had an expertise background and learned to be journalists. I had um, the opposite. And so once I moved into kind of New York Times level journalism, I had to push myself to get out of the, oh, we're just trying to save everyone mindset, or we're just trying to help and we're just trying to do our best to uplift the race to say, how can I both do this kind of liberation journalism, if you will, but also give it that hardcore edge that is remains, you know, me, I'm a journalist. And um, it's funny, somebody introduced me as an activist recently, and I was like, eh, no, mm -hmm. I'm not That's an right. activist, though I care about these issues. In my head, I would love to have um, wonderful outcomes come from the work that I do, but my main focus is about journalism. I just... I guess I've learned, I've learned this and now I can, like, I used to be like, oh my God, I can't believe that people are describing me this way, but because most of my friends wouldn't say that, but they say you're deeply empathetic and compassionate. And um, the same way I approach subjects like Simone, I felt really bad for her, what she went through. When she was sharing that story, I realized she's doing this. She's trusting me because she's saying, I want this story to make a difference for other people. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason. And she was stuck with me for a really long time. I was in this woman's life. Um, mm -hmm. I know her family. I know her, her parents. I know mm -hmm. her other children. I know the baby. The baby, um, know, he, he knows my voice um, because when she was pregnant, I was around her so much. And so that is a leap of faith. So I had to give, make it clear that I had deeply, deep compassion. And um, one, somebody recently said, what, why do you do the work you do? And I don't know what they were expecting me to say, but what I said was, it really pisses me off when people take this, when society takes this individual personal responsibility lens in a way to both, um, sort of deflect their own, our own responsibility for some of these systemic and institutional mm -hmm. issues, and also blame a person for the problems that, you know, they did not create, and to minimize the institutional and, um, you know, structural issues that pr uh, provide barriers mm -hmm. to their um, well-being. And that thing pisses me off. Anytime I hear it, I start to go, mm -mm. I'm going to prove that, that there is more to this story than just somebody is irresponsible. So mm -hmm. that, that's incredible. It really is. And, you know, one thing that really also struck me about the story was when, you know, you became a part of it. You were a character. You were talking about your own experiences and talking about, you know, uh, it, it, it helped make the story just so, so vivid. So I'd love to hear a bit more from, from both you, Linda and Jessica. What were those conversations like to, to insert yourself into the story? Okay, I'm going to uh, do my part first. Okay, <laughs> please. I hate that. Hate. So I hate putting myself in. So, <laughs> Jessica <like this. laughs> but Jessica can sniff out when I'm trying to avoid doing that. Mm -hmm. And so um, in the HIV AIDS story, I was writing about Essence Magazine at the time, you know, in the in the history of HIV AIDS journalism, blah, 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 blah. And so it was all like passive voice and third person, like weird. And she goes, why do you sound like, you know, like, weren't you there? Just say what you, how you were resp responsible. And in this story, it's so funny because it's the part where um, after the baby was born, I was in the hospital with Simone and so was Lato Latoya Ruby Frazier, the photographer. So we were there and Simone was getting really agitated because she wanted her other children to meet the new baby. Okay, we, I've gotten no sleep. I'm super tired. I have no sense of direction. I hate driving. And but I do have a rental car. So I said, all right, I will go we'll go pick up the kids for you. So then in the story, I write the, you know, all this third person weird thing of how I how the children got there. And so Jessica's like, okay, this is doesn't sound right. And so I'm like, yeah, trying to avoid. And so then she goes, can we fix this? And then she finally goes, who drove the kids? <laughs> I'm like, I did. And so she said, just say it for God's sake. 
And then that is the thing that a lot of people point to, oh, that was really moving when you went and picked up those kids. And I was thinking, I, it was like pulling teeth for her to make me write that in the first person. But it, it added so much to the story. So Jessica, tell us a bit about, you know, why, why, why you, you, you fought so hard to include all of that. Well, it's that, but also I think what, what you might've been thinking about too was when Linda writes about her own experience of being pregnant, right? The first, and, and having, you know, like, a, you know, a, a, a fancy, you know, doctor, she's going to the, o, the you know, this OBGYN and, and, and finding herself um, be, being grilled about her life. Does she, does she do drugs? Does this, does that? Because of, you know, various um, things that were being noted during the course of her pregnancy. And she was, you know, she mentioned, um, you know, I, I actually have an experience with this. And, and Linda has a, a sort of, uh, I would say, Linda has a sort of classic journalist um you know, perhaps especially drilled into people who have been newspaper reporters, ahem, you know, Nick, I know that you have also dealt with this, right? That reluctance to make themselves the story. You're just like, wait, I'm here to observe, I'm here to report, you know, but there's, this is something that, that comes up in, uh, you know, uh, other forms of journalism, magazine journalism, for sure, where it's like, but that's a, that's a critical part of the story because that was hard won experience, right? Nick, you used the phrase lived experience, right? So Linda really had that, right? She, you know, and she notes in the story um, what, what that was like. Um, and that also is humanizing. Um, that also is, um, you could say, you know, Linda, I'm sure, you know, maybe you can speak to this. Maybe it's something you were able to share as you were talking with people you were interviewing for the story, right? You weren't coming from the outside, like, tell me about these experiences, right? You, you could really connect um, and build a, a, a very special kind of trust um, is my impression. Mm. And I, um, I think it was also something Arlene said. It was, um, I know those New York Times readers will be judgy about Simone's background. And so I wanted to say, um, you know, I mentioned lightly Serena Williams, but I also want to say this is a, a problem that goes beyond class. And so I, di I did add my own story in. And because I was thinking, I don't like that. And even when, uh, you know, after the story came out, after all that work I did to humanize Simone, there were people who said, um, I, was it about her diet? She didn't eat right. I was like, mm -hmm. I didn't say anything about her diet. That is not, <laughs> I did not mention that at all. You don't know what her diet's like, or she wasn't going to the doctor or something, you know, there were these comments and I'm like, okay, I didn't, <laughs> she did go to the doctor. We, you know, we talked about that. So and, but I, I try to do that also with the experts like Arlene. She just did not spring fully, you know, um, out of Zeus's head with these um, ideas. You, you worked hard to get to the understanding that you have about weathering. And even to give it the term weathering, I love so much, uh, you know, about your creativity in that. And so I just try to with everyone, including, I guess now myself, is try to say, we're all part of this, mm -hmm. these stories. We're all, you know, we all have a skin in this game. And um, so I hope that answered your question. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Linda. And thank you, thank you all for this portion of the conversation. I'm going to now pass it over to my colleague, uh, Evelyn uh, Hemmons, um, but I want to remind everyone that Jessica and Arlene will be back for our Q&A session. Uh, Linda will stay right here. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing uh, Professor Evelyn Hemmons. Um, so Professor Hemmons is the Barbara uh, Goodman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Thank you, Nick. This is it's such a wonderful uh, moment to to be here in conversation with Linda and um, and I just want to thank uh, also uh, Arlene and, and uh, Jessica for their for their comments earlier. So, um, Linda, I'm going to give two short introductions and and then we'll jump into some scholarly reflections a, a, about your article. So. First is, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend and comrade for over 30 years, Vanessa Northington Gamble, 
She's an MBA PhD. She is university professor of medical and humanities, professor of medicine and professor of health policy and American studies at the George Washington University. She's also adjunct professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. She's a physician, a scholar and activist. She is an internationally recognized expert on the history of race and American medicine, racial inequities in health and healthcare and bioethics. Our second guest is Dr. Rachel Hardiman. She's associate professor and Blue Cross endowed professor of health and racial equity, founding director for the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity at the Division of Health Policy and Management at the University of, of Minnesota School of Public Health. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hardiman is a reproductive health equity researcher and she applies the tools of population health science and health services research to elucidate a critical and complex determinant of health inequity, racism. So I am sure we can have a wonderful conversation with these two esteemed uh, scholars. Um, and I thought uh, what we might do first is uh, Vanessa and, um, and Rachel might just, just give sort of an overall reflection on uh, what Linda was able to accomplish in this article. And then I have a specific question for each of you to address and Linda to respond to. So um, Vanessa, why don't you go first? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer this in two ways because <laughs> um, the, the article, um, there's a part of the article that's about some of the work that I did. Uh, in, and then I'll talk about it as a historian. Um, um, Linda, and, and it's good to see you again, Linda, it's been many, many years. <laughs> um, she talks about the article that was in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, we're talking about college educated women, the preterm delivery um, between college educated women and white women. And that was in 1992. In 1991, a group of us were at the CDC uh, talking about, and the title of the project was Preterm Delivery Among Black Women, colon, Psychosocial Factors and Physiological Responses. It was about racism. But in 1991, you could, we were like a cabal in the halls of the CDC talking about racism, but couldn't say it was racism. You know, so it's great that, you know, thinking this historically where Rachel can be upfront and say, this is what I'm about. So it shows how the scholarship and the attention to these issues, you know, ha has changed. And, and I will admit when I went to this meeting in 1991, they said we were gonna focus on Spelman graduates. And I'm like, why are and we I'm a Spelman graduate. I know, I know, <laughs> Evelyn. I, 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 I just, you know, I, I know you want to have your shout out about Spelman. So I, I did it, it before you it. did it. Okay. <laughs> so, but we was like, you know, it was like, why are we worried about Spelman women? What about the poor Black women? And then it was explained about the daily lives of Black women who were educated and, and their lived experience. So that's one comment that I, I want to say is how this, this discussion has changed. And then the other part of the, the, the article that I want to, to address is about Du Bois. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that W.E.B. Du Bois talks about infant mortality and mortality first in the Philadelphia Negro in 1899. But the, uh, um, but the thing about the Philadelphia Negro, there's a part of the Philadelphia Negro that does not get a lot of uh, emphasis. And that is that he talks about how the black mortality in Ward 7, the black people who left Ward 7 and moved to Ward 30, which is right next to it, their mortality declined because it was a place that did not have uh, some of the inadequate social conditions. So that is a, an important part of the story. And then the other thing is about this whole idea that it somehow is in the genes of black people. I mean, I remember a history of medicine meeting once where somebody said, 
um, that uh, black women have l lower birth weight babies because it allowed them to uh, deliver in the bush. And that was in his paper. And I was chair of the committee, but I dealt with him another way. But, uh, <laughs> Um, but but the thing is that, you know, like Du Bois talks about the high infant mortality rate in 1906. And he says, this is not a Negro affair, meaning it's not in the bodies of black people, but that with improved sanitation, uh, improved education and better economic opportunities that the, the infant mortality will decline. So we over a hundred years, over a hundred years, we've been trying to figure out and have a conversation where it's not just focusing on the bodies of black people somehow being different and then meaning inferior. Right, right. So I wanted to, before you respond, Linda, I wanted to give Rachel a chance to, to sort of make a reflection. And 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 Rachel, one of the things that it, it, it I wanna pick up on the point Vanessa just made. Uh, why do you think, Linda documents that it wasn't until the 1990s that researchers started doing rigorous systematic studies of this issue that was known in the 19th century. The disparity in the mortality rates was known since the 19th century, and yet researchers, especially in your field, didn't pick up this question. And so how did you think about that as you read the article, and, and then we'll let Linda make a response. Sure. Um, first, I have to say thank you um, for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be on this esteemed panel with folks that I deeply admire. And um, I think to Vanessa's you know earlier point, you know I I get to unapolog unapologetically name racism um, as both the fundamental cause of health inequities and reproductive health inequities, and also name it as the at the crux of the work that I do. And it's because of folks like you on this panel who, and, and Dr. Geronimus and others who have sort of laid the, you know, ha, have walked that path for many, many years. So, um, and I think one of, I, I remember the day that Linda, your article, your, your story was published. Um, and I remember sitting at home um, on my couch reading it and weeping and not because I was reading something that I never heard before, right? I, I, I both live it and also I study it. Um, but because of how beautifully you laid out the humanity of the story of Simone's story, but also did what I work so hard to do in, in my work as a researcher, which is to leverage the data and leverage the science and the statistics to tell to also tell that story. And I think one of the, the things that makes your piece so powerful is that you were able to do that so beautifully um, and in a way that I think spoke to people who just hadn't even hadn't even had to think, had the privilege to not even think about this issue. Um, and you know, I think a lot about the journey of you know shifting from a discussion of race and racial disparities to um, to a discussion of racism as the root cause of racial disparities and the shift of um, from understanding uh, or a failure to understand race really as a social construct and I think that's you know we, we're finally <laughs> we're finally getting there um, and you know I'm trained as a health services researcher where when I came into the field and and health policy researcher as well when I came in the field that's not you know we were controlling for race in our models we were not thinking about um, what it actually meant to um, find and report these you know disparate outcomes by race um, and it's taken us a long time I think to get to the point of producing sort of rigorous, you know, for lack of a better word, because I also, I mean, I, I think we also have to think about what we consider rigorous research to be, right? Because we've decided in the academy what that should look like, but honestly, um, there's plenty of rigorous research and lived experience and knowledge happening in community that we just don't consider to be part of, you know, part of the canon. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I, I think we, we, we still have a long ways to go though. And, um, but it is thanks to the, the sort of partnerships, I think, of um, scholars um, like Arlene and Scott and reporters and journalists like you, Linda, who are able to sort of tell that story in a way that lifts up both the science again, as well as the deep um, pain of those of those stories and narratives. Mm -hmm. 
So, so Linda, you did you did a great job at that. And so, you know, how how would you how did you come to realize that you really had to be in partnership with with people like Arlene and the work of Vanessa's work and and people like Rachel's work as well, as to make this story uh, have the kind of impact that you wanted. Wow, my first response was, I don't know S, about, but that's not true. Um, <laughs> here's, here's my real thought is, you know, Vanessa, I've known your work forever. I used, I to, yeah, I used to read anything you wrote like fiction. I mean, cause you're a wonderful, you know, both you, Evelyn too, and Arlene, the way you, uh, lay out your work. Sorry, Rachel, I'm going to catch up with you. But um, <laughs> the way you lay out your work, it's so interesting. Maybe I'm just like a nerd fangirl, but I'm really interested. I love reading, um, you know, your work. I love this idea. And, but here's the thing I noticed is, you know, like both, you know, both of you have been doing this forever. And then I was reading a, a, a study by David Williams, your colleague, your Harvard colleague. Mm -hmm. So then I'm reading another study by him. Then I go to his footnotes and half of his foot, footnotes are his own work. And I'm thinking, my God, y'all have been talking about this forever. No one is listening. That's why you have to keep doing it again. Here's another way that I can tell you the same thing, that it's not Black people's fault. This isn't genetics. It isn't something we're doing wrong. There is some the part of the conversation that has been missing until pretty much now, you know, I'm hearing it much more now out loud, is that it's not race, something in our genetics or something we're doing wrong. It is racism. And so that has finally been, you know, I hear it much louder, like Rachel, like you're saying, this is your, your newer um, generation is saying it directly. But I just kept thinking, my God, these people have been saying this for so long. Now I want to hear more. Mm -hmm. And um, for Arlene, Arlene hadn't had her work widely. You know, she was saying, I don't like to talk to journalists because they're mean to me and <laughs> they don't listen and they're just going for the quote. And then once my work gets out there, people are mean and they make fun or they try to do harm to me or, you know, hurt my family. And so, but also there was something about this that I said, you know what, I need to put it in my own way because mm -hmm. I was probably one of those people working at Essence. We're like, you know, our job was to say individual black women, you need to do better by doing X, Y, and Z. I wasn't talking about structural racism. I wasn't talking about these kinds of, this kind of inequality that you know, I was talking about individual responsibility just to black women. And so, you know, I think this is a long way of saying thank you. And I, you know, I, I have long seen your work. I just didn't have the language and knowledge and um, platform and courage to say it until more recently. Mm -hmm. Evelyn, can I ask Linda a question? Right ahead, of course. Uh, Linda, I, uh, when I was rereading the article for this for this uh, session, one of the things that really jumped out at me, maybe because I'm an older black woman these days, uh, <laughs> is you never call her Simone. Mm -hmm. That you call her Landrum. All through, and um, and as I was, you know, because you you read the story, you see how she's disrespected, she's not believed, mm -hmm. she's besmirched. Did you do that deliberately? Because a lot of times black women are never called, you know, it's always their first name, it's never their titles. So did you do that deliberately? No, that's just the New York Times structure. That's how okay. I'm okay. So, okay. Um, but it's funny in um, you know, I'm writing a book where I talk about the background of getting to know her and all this, and I found myself it's in copy edit now. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the publishing realm, you know, as opposed to magazine journalism, because I was forgetting because I know her. So I was like Simone this and then Landrum this, and I was switching all over the place. So I'll I'll have to see how to make it you know, more coherent in a kind of copy editing way, but no, that wasn't me, I, you know. <laughs> 
So I want, I'm going to get uh, uh, Rachel to, to respond to this question. So, you know, Arlene was talking about, you know, distru being distrustful of the media. And uh, but do you and maybe Vanessa wants to jump in on this as well. Do you think there's a role for the media in really getting, you know, getting the stories uh, like the kind that that Linda told in, 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 in her article? out there that helps researchers, that's important for researchers to deal with? I mean, does the, media, does the media really have an important role to play from your perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. And I feel I feel like absolutely. Um, I have found it to be critically important to engage with the media whenever I am publishing um, or have new or interesting um, findings because uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, I think it's important to be able to disseminate research, be, you know, and make sure that it doesn't just sit, you know, on, on a shelf in our, in our, in our offices in the ivory tower, right? But also, um, you know, the goal, my personal goal and the goal of the, the folks that I train and work with is to ensure that we can leverage our research um, to change the narrative, particularly around racism. Mm -hmm. And that requires um, engaging with really good and thoughtful journalists who are willing to tell those stories and are really, will, really willing to listen and to understand the nuances of this issue. And I think, um, you know, so I'm, I'm in Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, just a couple of miles from where George Floyd was murdered. And, you know, in the aftermath, um, you know, much of my work is in the space of looking at how policing and police violence impacts reproductive health. And, and, and I, um, had a lot of really interesting and I think critically important conversations with journalists in those moments after George Floyd's murder um, that helped to shape how we think about policing, for instance, as a public health issue, right? And so um, I think there's a lot, of it, I think it, it, we have to build those relationships. They're critically important. Um, I also have found myself in a lot of spaces where I am um, doing a lot of the work of educating, you know, journalists around, you know, and offering sort of that racism 101 in order for the context of the research that we're sharing um, to be told in that story to be told in a way that um, is authentic uh, for to the communities that are impacted and inauthentic to our findings. Um, I have some really interesting <laughs> um, stories that I could share around conversations after we published, um, I published a paper about a year ago in the um, National Academy of Sciences where we found that um, black newborns were more likely to survive in the hospital um, when they were cared for by black, you know, by a black physician, um, that mort mortality rate tr almost tripled when they were cared for by a white physician. And you can imagine all of the questions that came with that around, are you calling, or how dare you call white physicians racist and accuse them of, of killing black babies. And so for me, it was an important opportunity to both um, offer some historical context for why our healthcare system is inherently racist, um, and then help to walk people through and tell that story of why that and how that might show up in contemporary inequity, inequities like um, the ones that we found in that particular set of analyses. I mean, I agree with, um, um, with Rachel. I just wanna add a couple of things. In May, um, I did a session with the uh, Black Women's Health Imperative. Uh, for journalists mm -hmm. uh, in terms of educating journalists about covering race mm -hmm. and some of the issues that Rachel brought up, I brought up. Um, but then I also uh, used uh, Linda's article as a way of humanizing the narrative yeah. because I think a lot of times it comes across black babies die at twice the rate of yep. white baby, period. Yep. Um, instead of, in which this article shows, is that it is that many more Black mothers and families who are grieving. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Black babies dying. Mm -hmm. That is very different than saying twice, you know, the uh, infant mortality rate. And so, uh, so, uh, so I think that's important. And the other, the other thing that I think is important is what stories are you going to cover? I mean, that a lot of times I, I find journalists want to talk about the people, you know, the, you know, black people are oppressed, black people have been treated poorly by the medical profession. Yes, that is true. 
But at the same time, there have been black people who have fought racism, who have fought, you know, uh, to improve the health and lives of, of black people. And those stories aren't told as often. So I really do think that journalism plays a role, but at the same time, I think that uh, those of us who care for these issues find ourselves having to educate folks about, or, or, or as Rachel put it, walking them through it. Right, so, so, so Linda, um, I have two, two last points um, to, to ask you to respond to with respect to, to Rachel and Vanessa's comments. Did you struggle with how, to, how much to say this is about racism? I thought it was really a poignant moment in the article when you said, when you came out of the, your OBGYN office and said, you know, maybe there's something about the lived experience of race in this country that's key to understanding this issue. And did you feel like you could just go sort of, could you go more full bore toward, this is structural racism. This is what it looks like. This is how it looks like in people's lives. How, how, did, you, how did you think that through? I think because I was laying out um, kind of systematically all that was going on, it became really obvious. And so I couldn't not say it. I also think that I feel fortunate to have the New York Times Magazine as my home base and to have um, Jessica Lustig, who we heard from earlier, and Jake, our, our big boss, um, who really understand this and who it's, they're not saying, well, you shouldn't say that. They're like, say it more, <laughs> prove it. You know, they're saying, if this is the reality, then just say it and just, but, and prove it so that you're not, you know, spending all your time uh, dealing with people arguing with you. Right, and right. I really appreciate that in, in them. So, yeah. I want, I want to give you the last word before we turn to the questions. And that is, was there anything you wanted to add to the article that you had to uh, leave out and felt, you know, like you had to leave your left arm on the table or something. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, that's why I wrote a book for all that stuff that I had left over. Um, I want, I've talked more about the history of the reproductive justice movement and how that, and it, I really, it's sort of like Vanessa, what you were saying, and I love this about you. You've always done this and you're saying, you know what, all these bad things happen, but there were people trying to make a difference that get lost. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was part of it. So it just, that article was 10,000 words. So it was really long. And we were really trying to have a lot of the Simone um, experience in it. So some of that got left on the table, but that was one thing I wish I had had more space to say is mm -hmm. to talk about the black led reproductive um, justice movement. So that was kind of like the only thing that I missed. Yeah, no, I, I mean, because you're, you're right, Vanessa says it all the time, and, and we all really believe it, that there's a, there's a way in which we have to constantly disrupt this narrative that Black people as victims and not Black people as agents in trying to fix an enormously broken system. Um, and I think that um, this has been, um, it's been really important, and I really, and I certainly appreciate it, your ending on the, with the doula and back to the baby. I just thought that, <laughs> yeah. I just thought that was beautifully done, yeah. really beautifully done. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to, I, I, I want us to turn to the uh, Q&A now, and I think that I'm told that the first question, um, that Nick will ask the first question, so Nick will return, and Jessica and Arlene as well, I hope. Wonderful. Is great. Great. Yeah, that was very illuminating. I, I feel like I learned so much about how to improve my own journalism from from just listening to that uh, to your panel. Um, great. So the first question um, comes from and I promise I'm not playing favorites here. <laughs> my stat colleague, uh, Usha Lee McFarling and Usha asks, I'm wondering if Dr. Geronimus can talk about her negative experiences with the press and what we can learn from those interactions. Uh, well, if you force me to. Um, <laughs> I mostly try to re <laughs> suppress them. I do want, I want to start before I actually literally answer the question, but it is sort of a run up to answering that question. To say that it was long before the 90s that, pe that people in the academy were studying this and publishing and doing very thoughtful work. And people at the CDC were pulling together 
um, groups of people who are doing very thoughtful thinking about this. So one of why I bring that up is not to just correct the record, um, but because we were completely ignored to the point where now people who who actually now are carrying a torch don't even know we existed <laughs> at that time. And um, I think, you know, a lot of that was what happened in the politics of academia, but a lot, but some of it was also about the the politics of journalism. So I don't know to what extent that can be an object lesson for the future. And in that same vein, I am seeing that journalists seem now much more pulled into what I call, what I think of as very old wine and new bottles, which is some of this um, uh, gene wide association studies and, I don't know how many of you wasted your time and read this New Yorker article a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, I unfortunately did, but you know, I was fuming because I, the way they, they, you know, elevated the main person they were talking about, she, she did not deserve, and I could argue with her on every point she made, and the way they sort of again caricatured Sandy Darity's response um I thought it, it it not only brought up my own memories but um but it made me worry that you know I've been feeling we're at a moment now with stories like Linda's with with just the Black Lives Matter movement with with sort of where we are as a country where we can finally move away from even having to dignify the questions about it's genetic or it's culturally, you know, these differences by so-called race are genetic or essential or deficient. And then I see that article and I see, I see all the ways within academic public health that um, some of this gene, new, new genetic uh, technology is allowing those same stories to start surfer surfacing and I they have tremendous benefits in the sense structurally they get huge funding from the government they um, people get promoted in academia much easier if they're doing that kind of work um, and so I think journalists have to in some ways be one of the guardians um, to both avoid getting sucked into that and 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 becoming the um, uh, I want to say foghorn, but it's a different kind of bullhorn <laughs> um, for those. Uh, that's my foggy brain. Um, um, uh, and also, you know, not seeing the, the other things that are getting their day this last year or so, but we want to keep them getting their day um, uh, in the future. And, and the last thing I'll say about that, and then maybe if you really want me to, I'll talk a little about what was happening to me. Um, but I don't want to take up a lot of time with that. Um, um, is this new version called Deaths of Despair? I think this speaks a little also to what Vanessa was saying about um, uh, people are not just um, victims. I mean, the whole concept of weathering is meant to capture both the the lethal exposures and toxic exposures and the active mm -hmm. effort coping. Mm -hmm. um, but we have this new thing called Deaths of Despair that's got an enormous press and doesn't exist. Um, uh, um, and it's first of all, pointing, you know, looking more at a demographic that is having certain problems now, white working age men, but those are not the worst problems and, and certainly not the only problems that are being had. And secondly, even for them, that's a fantasy story. Um, and so I, I just very worried. I'm glad for this moment. And I hope this moment, you know, when I was when I was watching the Polly Murray documentary last week that came out, you know, I was very struck by her. For, well, everything about her, but but there was this one phrase she said that that she lived long enough um, 
for her lost causes to be found. <laughs> and I sort of feel this is a moment where a bunch of our lost causes are being found. Mm -hmm. But I, but I'm afraid they're going to get lost again in in the well, ra you know razzle dazzle of, of all this genetic technology or right. or the kind of way it fits kind of a certain kind of victim narrative to talk about deaths of despair or these poor white no, working no, class people. Thank you, Arlene. Can we can, can we hone in a little bit on this? Because the question came in the chat that said, so what do the academics think the journalists can do better? But I also wanted to ask Jessica to speak to what do the what, what as you know as an editor what, what do you want the journalists to do better I mean because I I, I would I would just make a, a comment uh, on my own work this this past year as COVID and write and writing and talking about the disproportionate impact on communities of color I have been I have had some fantastic conversations with journalists mm -hmm. usually if they've read something else I wrote or read something that Vanessa wrote or, or, or can reference Rachel's work and things like that, then it's that we have a better conversation. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, this is a direct quote. The young woman said to me, Professor Hammers, can you explain medical racism in America from 1619 to the present? And I only have 15 minutes. <laughs> and I said, right. no, I can't and I won't. And I'm not going to even entertain this so so jessica and and i'd like to hear uh linda's re uh, reflections on that part too so how, what do you think we need to be in terms of creating better interactions between the scholars and the journalists right and the uh, and the other part of that question evelyn is what can scholars do better instead yeah, of right. Just, like, I, just, that's what yeah. i want to i want to hear yeah both sides yeah. of that one well, um, I think I think you're putting your finger on um, something that's really uh, essential. And um, going back to a point that Dr. Hardiman made when you all were talking just a bit ago, but but I was listening in. Um, she was making the point, and you all you all were saying you have shared this experience of finding yourselves in the position of having to educate um, journalists, having to walk journalists through it, right? And so. Um, there are a lot of factors to unpack here, right? And so, I mean, one one of the the, the most baseline ones is um, is that uh, most Americans don't have um, <laughs> an excellent educational grounding in the causes of you know disparities, and we're focused here on racial disparities um, in in all sorts of outcomes. But if we're speaking specifically um, in terms of health. Right. That, that as we're all saying here, there is there is a wealth of data. Um, you know, you all have pointed out this goes back to you know Du Bois documenting this um, in in the 19th century, right? And so we have history, we have science, we have data, but you know, and and we have we have scholars working in the field, scholars with you know decades of expertise, um, studies, reports um exhaustively done and yet you have journalists many journalists starting from zero um and not just starting from zero without that knowledge but starting with a lot of um, preconceived notions and assumptions um and, and um that that have to be dispelled and there's um so my focus is on what what journalists need to do, right? And so there's like two tiers here. There are those who um, uh, have the power to make assignments. So those are the editors, uh, people in in my kind of role, and it's um, it's incumbent on people with with this kind of role to um, pay close attention to the stories that we are assigning. Um, which journalists get the chance um, and repeated chances to um, to do um, the the kind of work that that um, you know that is on a platform like the New York Times or the New York Times Magazine? Um, which experts are said? So this goes back to a point I think some of you were just making, right? And this is something that Linda and I have talked about quite a bit. Um, I know that it is very important to Linda to um, 
focus on the work of longstanding experts in the field, but very frequently she's also saying, listen, we need to, um, we need to center um, as, as much as possible the work of, uh, you know, black scholars who have been, you know, focused on this work for like, we need to highlight the, the, the work, <laughs> including going back to Du Bois, right? We need, we're gonna make this, we're gonna make this connection really clear because to be honest, a lot of the work of a story like this is educational also. And so we're having to do that work um, for the audience, uh, you, you know, who, many of whom are starting from zero. And I, I will be totally honest with you, sometimes for colleagues, um, I can tell you that uh, this story was nominated um, for the, Pulitzer Prize by the New York Times as an organization. So it's not me. I don't get to make that decision. It's an in-house group. Right? And I can remember talking to, uh, you know, a longstanding editor at the time, you know, a very smart editor um, who was writing the, you know, working with me to write the nomination text. And he was like, oh, don't we need to say that it's not only about, like what Linda documents is that it's not only about lifestyle choices. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> it, it's that, hang on. <laughs> We're still there after reading the story. So you have to, like, yeah. that's yeah. what you all are yeah. up against in the work that you do. That's the challenge of the work that you do, I, I can see, but it's also a, a real challenge for the journalist. So just going back again, I don't want to eat up too much space here, but I talked about editorial responsibilities, but the responsibility, I know we're talking to a host of, of science writers here too. And I think going back to what Linda and I knew we would have to do in the story as, as much as possible, right, is make it airtight, make it bulletproof, you know, do that work, that research of reading the study. I mean, just <laughs> Linda's, Linda's fact checkers at the New York Times Magazine love her because she's not just making claims. She's not like, you know, saying, making a statement. She is citing well, like <laughs> to fact check her article is an education unto itself because you are reading the study you're, and, and, we're, and we cite those in the piece. We, you might notice, we fre frequently, we don't just say, oh, studies have shown, which studies, yep. what are the gold standards, cite the research, cite the people who did the research, you know, get, get those, uh, that information makes it more credible to the reader. So I think that's also part of the work of, of journalists to really make sure that, you know, interrogate which experts you're, you're citing uh, which experts you're reaching out to. As Linda's saying, reading those footnotes in the studies to find those, um, those uh, you know, the work that's already there. So thank you, Jessica. That's, 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 that, makes me, that makes me feel better actually. But Linda, you get the last word on this. And um, we have, you know, we've all benefited from your amazing work, but uh, you know, going forward, what, what would you say to a, a young journalist that you're mentoring about how to really foster, um, uh, you know, the kind of relationships and partnerships with researchers on studies like this and on, on the fraught issues of race in America as we all have to address? Well, um, I'm so honored to, I, I'm still, my head is spinning because I'm, this, this Zoom room is so wonderful. But I wanted to offer this example is to say, I don't just call you all when I need something, <laughs> okay? So as far as the historians and the researchers and the experts, I don't just, you know, hey, I, uh, can you answer this thing for me? I pay attention to your work outside of the thing I need. And so, um, um, Evelyn and Vanessa did this podcast, uh, or I guess it was a Zoom thing. I was there. It was really good. And you know what I thought? I thought, ooh, Vanessa said that thing. I got to remember to always give credit to the people who were doing the work, fighting against some of this mess in the past, because that is what your work reminds me of. And it, you know, this wasn't that long ago. It was during COVID. And so mm -hmm. I thought I will remember that. Um, Arlene and I had breakfast and okay, I stepped into it by going, hey, can we talk about diseases of despair? Okay, you heard that, that <laughs> she does not like that. 
So she schooled <laughs> me and said, it is not just people just giving up. It's high effort coping. She gave me a book to read, All Our Kin. I read that book, which helped me when I was writing my next piece on Chicago. And that really helped me to think um, about communities, about other research. And Evelyn, my God, she, um, I was my 1619 project essay, which is now part of a book. Um, we're really bulletproofing that because of so much, you know, pushback and so much, you know, harshness about the book itself. So my um, essay chapter is on medicine. It got much bigger. So Jake called and he said, you got to choose to uh, one expert to um, vet you. So can you give us three names? Here are my names. Evelyn Hammond, <laughs> Vanessa Gamble, and Dorothy Roberts. Okay, those were my three. So I'm like, well, I'm sure Evelyn will be too busy. Well, thank you. Evelyn read that thing with a fine tooth comb and pushed me to think about things slightly differently. It was a tweak, but it changed the way I thought because what I was saying was how Southern doctors used to think was a myth. And she's like, no, this wasn't a myth. This was intentional. This was in, in, in and so I knew that, but I wasn't saying it in strong mm -hmm. enough. And so after you vetted that, which I am so grateful for, and um, so it was important for me, it's always important for me as a journalist to, to think this isn't a one-off. These are not just sources. These are people that I can learn from outside of when I need a transaction. Um, you, so I am really grateful to the connection we have and the work that you each do. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Linda, uh, for, and I, I, I'm sure I'm thanking you from all of us. I want to thank uh, Nick and all of the panelists, and you guys have made some really thoughtful commentaries and, and insights. And also, apparently, people don't want to leave the, the, the session. Um, I don't know how much more time we have, but I, I want to kind of bring us into closure. I mean, the, Linda, this article is really, it's just truly, um, it, it's, it's truly brilliant. And um, I think it it, um, it it sheds light on uh, on black maternal and infant mortality in such a powerful way that um, I think honestly I think your narrative has helped to save some women's lives and I think that is I mean I can't think of higher praise to you for for your work we regret we don't have a lot more time that we can keep talking. Um, there are two other small groups sessions following this one, one on race and biomedicine, one on indig indigeneity and climate science. And so uh, people know how to get to uh, those other um, sessions. But I just wanna thank all of you. I think this is wonderful background and context and exploration. And clearly people wanna hear more. So we'll have to figure out something else for, for another time. But thank you all so much for this today. Great to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. All right. Thank you.